evening. Good evening. How's everyone doing? We're awake. We're awake. I can barely see you. These rows are gone. I don't know if I like it yet. Um, did we just get rid of like the splash zone? Was I spitting too much, Tyler? Was that what's going on here? My apologies. You guys should be safe. Especially, what's going on this side? No one wants to sit up front. Um, <laughs> all right. We are back in week number three of our series on First Thessalonians. And I'm excited to, uh, to dive back into the word tonight. But I wanted to start with a story that hopefully will eventually make sense. But I want to tell you about when I was in elementary school. And when I was in elementary school, I absolutely loved to read. Like, I read all the time. I would set my alarm before school so I could wake up and read for half an hour. Like, that's how addicted I was to reading. It was wild. I, I don't know what happened. I think maybe, like, Netflix or Instagram just, like, corrupted my, uh, what do you call it, attention span. And I, I've re- I'm really bad at reading now. Um, but I used to love reading. And there was this author, Rick Royden, who wrote the Percy Jackson series. Some of you might have heard of him. Uh, but he had just had uh, his new series come out. So there was a new book to read in a totally different series that I was super excited about. And I could not wait to get this book. Um, and so every Tuesday was Grandma Tuesday. And we would, Grandma would pick us up from school on Tuesdays, and we would spend the, the afternoon with her, eat dinner at her house, and then go home. And so this morning, this Tuesday morning, my mom, she grabs me before school, and she looks me in the eyes, and she says, Ethan, you cannot ask your grandma to buy you this book because you can wait till it comes out from the library. So naturally, as soon as grandma picks me up, we're on our way to buy this book. And uh, we get to the store, we buy the book, we get home, we have dinner, I start reading, and we get home. And it does not take long for mom to figure out what happened because I walked in with a book. I wasn't that smart. Uh, I didn't even try and hide it. But uh, poor grandma, I didn't, she didn't know, and she felt terrible. that I went behind both of their backs and uh, I don't remember exactly what happened, but I definitely was grounded for a few weeks after that one because um, mom was not happy. Because what happened was I went directly behind her back. She gave me a direct instruction that I remembered. I felt a little guilty about it in the moment, but then I had the book. Um, but I, I remembered and just did what she told me not to do. And so the point of this is, is tonight, as we look in First Thessalonians, Paul has instructed this church and how they should live and what they should do. And they've done the exact opposite of what I had done when I was in elementary school. I'm sure no one else has done something like that. But what had happened was that they heard his instruction and they actually did it. That they were living out what Paul taught them. And it's going to be really cool to see. So just quickly to recap, we see that from the very start that Paul is encouraging and supporting this church, that he's encouraged by them, that he's praying for them. Last week, Luke talked about uh, chapter 3 and the encouragement that he received from Timothy. Paul was so concerned for the well-being of this church that he sent his most trusted disciple to go and check on them. And he hears back encouraging news that they are doing well. And this takes us into chapter 4, where we really get to the main point of this message. We get to the crescendo of the letter, what Paul is really trying to get to. We arrive here in chapter 4, verse 1. Let's just start with the first two. He says, additionally then, brothers and sisters, additionally then, he's, he's building to the meat of the letter, what he really wants to get across, his main point. Additionally then, brothers and sisters, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received instruction from us on how you should live and please God, that they have received instruction. They know what they're supposed to be doing. Paul's been clear. Paul doesn't beat around the bush. He is clear in what is supposed to be done. And then these four words are incredibly important. As you are doing. As you are doing. This is not one of Paul's angry letters. Can anyone think of an angry Paul letter? I was thinking about a lot of them this week because I was just so struck by how different this letter feels than some of the other letters. When Paul writes to the Corinthian church, when he writes to Galatia, there's a very different tone to the letter because Paul's angry. He's upset with them because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. He's instructed them and they've just gone and done their own thing. 
I wrote down a few of these. I could, I could go on for a long time about some of the things that Paul has said. 1 Corinthians 5.1, he says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and the kind of sexual immorality that not even is tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Paul sounds angry to me. In the next chapter, I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is not one wise person among you that is able to arbitrate between fellow believers? Instead, brother goes to court against brother, and that before unbelievers, that they were suing one another. Paul's angry about this the next chapter. He writes a very different letter to the Corinthians. Galatians 1, 6 and 7. I am amazed that you are so quickly turning away from who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. He's kind of saying, like, I'm amazed at how dumb you are, that you have heard this teaching, and then you've gone the complete other way. In verse 3, he says as much, O foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you? Because in Paul's mind, it's how could you be doing this unless you were under a spell? Could I have been any more clear on what you're supposed to be doing? And Galatians just off doing whatever they want. And Paul's writing them this letter. One of, one of my favorite memes, maybe you've seen this, is when there, someone says something stupid on the internet about Christianity, and someone comments, Paul is typing. So Paul's writing them a letter. Maybe you haven't seen that, but I think it's pretty funny. But the church has received this instruction, as you are doing, that they are listening and living out what Paul has taught them. And he says, do this even more. That this, he doesn't want this letter to become a source of pride for the Thessalonian church. He doesn't want them to feel like they've arrived, that they're in peak form. Because we know that that's not true. We know that they're not perfect, even though Paul's hearing good things about them. He's encouraging them to, to continue pushing on, to continue growing. Which builds to verse 3. What I would call Paul's thesis statement of the entire letter. This one, this one verse is what Paul has been building to the whole time. Because he says beforehand that you should live and please God. You've received this instruction. And this just had me wondering, what does it mean to please God? What does it mean to live in a way that is pleasing to God? And Paul wastes no time. Verse 3. For this is God's will. What is his will for you to live a life that is pleasing to him? For this is God's will, your sanctification. That you keep away from sexual immorality. That each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. This means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner. Because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses, as we also previously told and warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. What Paul is building to here is one of the most important questions that a person can ask themselves. A question that I've asked myself many times, that I'm sure you've probably asked yourself. What is God's will for my life? What does he want me to do? Where should I go to school? What should my major be? What do I want to do when I grow up? Should I date this person? Who am I going to marry? Which flannel should I put on this morning? I don't know. There are a number of different questions. Should I play this sport? Should I quit this sport? God, what is your will for my life? Anyone ever asked that question before? I'm sure almost everyone has. And Paul makes it so simple in a way that only Paul can. What is your primary calling? All of these things are secondary. All these other questions are secondary. What is your primary calling? It's your sanctification. And so what is your sanctification? Sanctification is just a fancy term for meaning the process of becoming holy. The process of becoming holy. And holiness is this, this sense of purity, this set, set apart. 
It is perfection. And our example for holiness is Jesus. So in essence, what is Paul saying here? That the call of your life is to spend the rest of your life seeking to become more and more like Jesus. To live and act in the way that he did. The example that he has set for us. That 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 is what God is calling you to do for the rest of your life. And all of these other things will figure itself out. That those will become clear as time goes. But your primary focus is growing in your personal holiness. Growing in your journey with Jesus. That that's what this life is all about. So this is Paul's main point. In the next few verses, he, he, he does that little indented uh, comma, bullet point, whatever you want to call it. Now this is part of your personal holiness. That Paul is talking about sexual sin, about sexual immorality. I want to make sure that it's clear that, that fleeing from sexual sin is not all that is involved in living a life of holiness. But for whatever reason, Paul decides to focus on that in this letter, in the section of Scripture. He goes into depth on why sexual immorality is so dangerous and poisonous to your holiness. That, remember that the holiness is the sense of purity. In the most pure form, that Jesus is our example for this. And what sexual sin does is it corrupts and it poisons. And it, it begins to destroy your holiness. It takes you further from Jesus. It doesn't bring you closer. So what, is, what does he say? Well, let me quickly define what sexual immorality is. Sexual immorality is any sexual act that goes against God's design for sex, which was designed in a marriage covenant between a man and a woman. Let me say that again. Sexual immorality is any sexual act that goes against God's design for sex, which he designed to be between a man and a woman in a marriage covenant. So I'm not going to list them off for you, but everything that is in that circle, that is outside of that marriage covenant, is considered sexual immorality. And it is to have no place in the life of the believer. That this sexual sin does not go together with this call to holiness. That they cannot go together. And so we must flee and remove these impurities from our life as we, as we go on this call. In verse 4, he says that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles. I think what Paul is getting at here is the fruit of the Spirit, self-control. That self-control is supposed to be a part of our life. And that we cannot be controlled by the temptations of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, He says, this is what the Gentiles do. Those who do not know God live in this way. And if you remember from that quote in in Corinth, that they were even worse than the Gentiles, that the way that this church was living. That's why they were getting this angry letter from Paul. And it was part of this culture. And so remember that this letter is not an angry one from Paul. It's not like the principal is calling home because you did something wrong. That's not why Paul's writing. He's writing to encourage and warn them. And so what he's saying is, watch out for this. It's not that Paul has heard reports of sexual immorality in the Thessalonian church. But he's warning them. Because he's seen it happen. He's writing from Corinth. Where he's watching these things happen before his very eyes. How dangerous it can be to the church. To the individual believer. And so he's issuing them a warning. Be self-controlled. Do not allow this in your life. Do not allow this in the church to control in holiness and honor. Holiness makes sense. The honor part comes in the next verse. In verse 6, this means one must not transgress against and take advantage of a brother or sister in this manner because the Lord is an avenger of all these offenses that we previously told and warned you about. We must honor one another the body of the church. Because I want to be clear that as much as you might think so, sexual sin is never just affecting or against yourself. It affects the people around you. It is not just a one-person thing. 
And so if we're to respect and honor and build up the church, that it can't be part of our lives, any of our lives. So we must respect and honor one another and fight to flee from it. And Paul summarizes all of this in verse 7. He gets back to his main point. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. And the impurity that that Paul is specifically referring to here is that sexual sin, the sexual immorality. But that's not the only impurity that we have to fight against. And I'm running low on time, and I wish I had a whole other sermon that I could talk about this. And I encourage you to go into more depth into that in your small groups. And what these other impurities are that we're called to flee from in this pursuit of holiness, in this goal, in this call to become more like Jesus. What else do we have to leave behind? Because Paul is clear that sexual sin is one of those things. But it's not the only one. That this is our call. So how do we live out God's will? What does it look like to seek to to follow this this big call that he's placing on our life? And Banj, you can come as as we begin to close here. And I think this answer is as simple as Paul when he says what what God's will for our life is. It's to take daily steps towards growing in our holiness. It's about taking daily steps. It's not a process that we will complete in a day or a week. Or in all reality, in this lifetime. This is a journey of pursuing holiness that we will be fighting each and every day for the rest of our lives. Which sounds daunting. But it's a day-by-day process of taking steps each day to grow closer and closer. To become more and more like Jesus. I want to share from from Romans 12. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. And Paul is is getting at the same point here when he's writing to the Roman church. He says, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. To present our bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. Sexual immorality can have no place in that. Because that is an impurity that stains our holiness. That that is not living as a living sacrifice. He says that this is your true worship. And then in verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this age. Do not live like this world. Do not live like the Gentiles do. And how they pursue the desires of their flesh but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Once our minds are renewed, we will see what this will is that is good and pleasing to God. And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that that will is your sanctification, that you become like this holy person he is describing. So what transforms us? What keeps us from conforming and allows us to be transformed? I think it's two things. I think it's God's word. I think it's his Holy Spirit. That just like this passage that we read tonight is teaching us how we walk better on this journey of holiness. That we leave sexual immorality behind. It's making clear this call on our life. But like I said, there is so much more to this journey. There's so much more that you need to know from this word. As you read and learn and understand and meditate on this word, you are learning more and more how to better follow Jesus. What this journey looks like. So make sure you're reading his word. That you're studying, that you're understanding it. That you're paying attention when it tells you what you're supposed to do. Because those are all things that we need to implement as we walk on this journey. And then the Holy Spirit. In verse 8, he mentions that God is the one who gives his Holy Spirit to us. 
that this word makes no sense without his spirit, that we need to, to be taught, we need to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit to actually learn and live it out. So don't forget that. That if we're reading and trying to pursue holiness all on our own, that we stand no chance. That I can do nothing on my own and you can do it not on your own. That we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. Guys, this is a big call. This is a really big call that Jesus has placed on our life. One that we're going to spend the rest of our lives chasing after. But it starts with just taking daily steps. What can I do today? What can I leave behind today that will allow me to walk in holiness? Start to become more like Jesus, to, to talk and act and to live the way that he did. This is the call.